Okay, great. Sounds great. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, all right, well, we're going to go ahead and, and jump right in. So today I am going to be uh, talking about busting the winter blahs with pineapple lily. So we're going to go through the uh, the basics of a relatively new crop to floriculture and uh, see if we can get some of you guys to start growing this, this awesome plant. So uh, my name is Allison Carlson, and like Brian said, I am a postdoctoral research associate at NC State. All right, and we're going to be talking about busting the winter blahs with pineapple lily, this beautiful plant here. Um, so just taking this photo in of this plant that I am, I well, I guess most people would call obsessed with. Um, all of my colleagues at NC State know how much I love Eucomus, and many of them call me the Eucomus queen. Um, it's a it's a, a beautiful plant. You can see the inflorescence here with the uh, the star shaped flowers that open from the bottom up. It comes in several different colors now that breeders have started working with it and coming up with a lot of new varieties and and, and cultivars to work with. Um, at the top of that inflorescence is a uh, cluster of of bracts, and with the leaves are pretty pretty succulent, and they come from a bulb and form a rosette and um, form all around the inflorescence. So a little bit of an of an overview here of what I'm going to be going over: um, some background on Eucomus, uh, propagation planting and you know and some production information like production temperatures fertilization requirements um, pests and diseases the use of plant growth regulators and then also a little bit about cut flower production because I've been uh, working on that a lot with Eucomus as well it's a very versatile crop alright so getting right in uh, pineapple lily the genus is Eucomus there's about 15 species um, and many hybrids that are being developed um, in this genus. It's a bulbous perennial, so it does come from a true bulb and comes back year after year. It's hardy to, to zone six, which is what the literature says, but um, there's been some excellent work being done at Cornell with Eucomus, you know, up in, up in New York where it's definitely not zone six, and um, they have had Eucomus come back year after year there as well. So zone five, um, with a little bit of protection, um, it will it will definitely come back. And after the winter we had in Raleigh last year, which was unseasonably cold, um, I was worried that our Eucomus may not come back uh, this past summer, but it but it did. So it's these, especially the newer hybrids, are proving to be a little more uh, cold hardy than some of the uh, the straight species. It's been mostly used as a landscape plant, um, but it's more and more being used in pot production and cut flower production. So in the photo here on the right, um, you can see some Eucomus plantings. These are, this is a photo taken from our horticultural field labs at NC State, um, where the awesome guys out there incorporated some Eucomus into the plantings around the field lab. So. As we're going to be mainly, I'm going to be talking about Eucomus's potted plants today. So these, here's just some examples of some excellent um, potted Eucomus. You know, they can be included in mixed containers. I mean, how gorgeous is that? Um, and then tiny piney ruby on the right, just beautiful coloration, nice size. You know, excellent inflorescences. Um, they also have a great post-harvest life, uh, especially on the plant. They can pers persist for, for months. So propagation. Um, mainly, you know, this is propagation, but then also how you're going to receive the Eucomus plants from the, the wholesalers that you buy them from. Um, bulbs is the main way and probably the best way to get Eucomus plants started. 
so there's uh, different sizes. The, the plants for potted production um, tend to grow smaller, so the bulbs tend to be a little bit smaller, and but they still produce flowers. And the ones for, for cut flower production, I'm going to throw cut flower stuff in here throughout this like whole presentation just because, I don't know, it's, it's what I do. Um, the ones for cut flower production are going to be a little bit bigger because they need a little more energy to produce those nice huge inflorescences. So if you want to propagate Eucomus, um, you can, they can be prop propagated by bulb division. So in the photo on the left um, is a Eucomus plant that I dug up and you can see the main mother, bul mother bulb in the center and then there's little bulblets starting to come off of the sides of those. And once those get to be a decent size, um, they can be just broken off of the mother bulb and then replanted. So Eucomus readily sets out these bulblets. And in the photo on the right is a, a cut flower variety that we dug out of the field and was transplanting. And in the middle, um, you can see where the mother bulb was and then all the other bulblets coming off of that all around it forming a ring um, of other plants that could be uh, divided and then replanted. Uh, they can also be propagated via cuttings. Uh, Eucomus loves to live. Um, they are very easy to propagate so you can take leaf cuttings um, just like you would uh, uh, a uh, snake plant, just taking leaf cuttings and making sure you get the, the right side down. Um, just stick them in, in a substrate and they'll start to form little bulblets along the edge of the leaf cutting. But you can also take the top of the inflorescence, so that little bract cluster that's at the top of the inflorescence, and you can, you can propagate it that way too and little bulbs will start to form. So the photo on the left shows one of those bract clusters that was taken from the top of the inflorescence and propagated and you can see two little bulblets start to form off of that and even um, some roots coming off of it. And then on the right um, shows Eucomus being propagated from seed. So you can't really Eucoma seed is not commercially available, um, but if you had plants, you could propagate them that way. Um, at NC State this past summer, we found out just how easy it was to propagate them by seed. Um, we went out into the fields this past summer and to clean up our Eucomus bed because we have tons of Eucomus out in the field for cut flower production. And there were all these little um, blades of little tiny plants coming up around the Eucomus and we were a little confused as to what those would be because I don't know it looked kind of odd it wasn't a normal weed that we usually see growing out in the field and so um, me and our technician Ingram we pulled up a couple of them and they looked like little tiny Eucomus so we hadn't harvested all the flowers from the previous summer and so they they set seed and those seeds survived the winter and they germinated. So um, it's, it's easy to propagate, but these two methods of with the cuttings and the seed, unfortunately it takes about three to five years for them to flower via this method because it takes a while for that bulb to really gain enough um, size in order to support producing an inflorescence. So that's that's one drawback of that, which is why most people buy them as bulbs in order to propagate them. All right, so planting in production. Um, so this photo is from a, a PGR study that uh, me, Brian Whipker, and uh, John Dole did uh, on Eucomus. And these are some of the these are the methods that uh, we used to produce this crop, and also um, this information is from the the culture guides that Golden State Bulb Growers has come up with for their Aloha Lily series, and that's one of the resources um, that is in the material section that you have access to. Um, so, for you know more information on this, yeah, you can look at that as well. 
but we put uh, one bulb per six and a half inch pot. You know, if you have a bigger pot, um, say you're doing a you know container, uh, a mixed container, you could put two or three per pot. Um, we use a typical peat-based substrate, um, but even uh, mixes with with bark in them for a little extra drainage would be fine too. They're really not not picky about that. That would be dependent on on your growing situation and your habits. Um, we had we planted them about an inch deep, so there was an inch about an inch of substrate on top of the bulb, and highlight highlight deepens the colors in eucomus so giving them a good amount of light will make sure that you get nice coloration on the ones that have like the beautiful purple and and pink colors so um, but there is a point where it's too much light so that's something that you know you'll have to keep an eye on to make to make sure that they're not getting too much light because it'll kind of bleach them out we see this more in field production in the cut flowers um, but still something you know, depending on where you are and how you're growing, you would, you know, want to keep an eye on. They're about a 13 to 16 week crop time, uh, but they are really responsive to temperatures. So increasing temperatures will help move them along a little bit. All right, so production temperatures. Um, well, wait, before I move on to that, I see that there is a question. Um, do the seed need a cold spell to grow? Since I just saw that, I will answer that question. I don't know about the seed. If they need some some type of vernalization, they, they got it while they were in Raleigh, the ones that germinated um, this past summer. But I do know that the bulbs need a cold treatment in order to flower. So... I would assume that it would be, I think it'd be safe to say that they would need some sort of cold treatment, but I'm not exactly sure what that would be. So hopefully that helps. All right, all right, production temperatures. So I made this cool little graphic um, showing the, the optimal, tolerable, and uh, detrimental temperatures, day and night temperatures for producing eucomus. Um, so you wanna make sure that temps don't drop below 38 because I mean they are kind of tropical so they don't like it too cold but they also don't like it too hot so above 85 Fahrenheit um, you'll see some high temperature damage and you may want to put some um, if you can't reduce that temperature put some shade over them and that'll help protect them a little bit um, but you want to, you know, keeping things around 60, 62 is good. Uh, after planting, if you keep them at a constant, so like day and night between 60 and 62 Fahrenheit um, until emergence, that will help them um, sprout evenly. So it'll help keep everyone on the same schedule because sometimes uh, there's ones that are a little ahead of schedule than others and some that are a little behind so keeping the temperature constant until emergence will help them be more uniform all right so fertilization um, eucomus aren't really heavy feeders they actually get tip burn when they're over fertilized um, and you can see that in the photo here where you know just typical tip burn the the tips and if it's really bad along the edges it can they turn to yellow and necrotic um, so they need light to moderate fertilization um, that's about you know 100 150 parts per million nitrogen from shoot emergence so when that when the plant breaks the the substrate surface to flowering um, or you can incorporate slow release uh, pre-plant fertilizers into your substrate and then fertigate with 50 parts per million until visible bud. And visible bud is when the inflorescence um, starts to uh, come out of the rosette of flowers. So you can just you can just see that the top of those bracts showing. That's visible bud. And a 20-10-20 uh, fertilizer works just fine. 
So you want to make sure you keep an eye on on the fertilization and uh, do you know clear water leaches just to get some get the EC down a little bit and make sure they don't um, they don't start to show that tip burn because that's not that's not really good for for post harvest and and for you know selling the plants. People want a nice a nice clean green plant. All right, pests and diseases. So this is one of my favorite things about Eucomus because it's not, it's not a problematic crop. It's not highly susceptible to any one pest or, dis or disease. There's not one thing that you just always are going to have to worry about. Um, you know, unlike some crops like poinsettias that <laughs> they tend to have their uh, their issues, but they're great. Don't don't get me wrong. Um, you just want to make sure that you keep the environment, you know, unfavorable for things like bull brats and botrytis. So, you know, watch your overwatering and make sure you have good airflow and good substrate drainage, and just scout for insect damage and diseases, you know, just like you would any other crop, just so to stay on top of anything that might happen. Um, now, one of the really interesting things that I found out about Eucomus during my graduate studies uh, when I dissected a, a Eucomus plant and learned even more than I ever wanted to know about it um, was that the plant is full of these calcium oxalate crystals so the photo on the bottom of the slide is of this and this is just in the sap of the plant and these crystals um, are what keep uh, pests from eating Eucomus. So Eucomus in the landscape is deer resistant um, because of these calcium oxalate crystals. So when animals feed on them, uh, these crystals like puncture their gums and you know in their mouth and um, inflame the tissue and make them not want to eat it. So this that's a really really cool thing. A little nerd alert about uh, about Eucomus that I found was neat. So we did encounter, um, during our, our PGR study that we did, we did encounter these nasty guys, um, yellow striped army worms. They, they can do a lot of damage in a little bit of time. They, uh, they like to eat. And we found some of these, but luckily we found it early because we were being proactive and scouting and um, saw the damage that they were doing to some of the emerging inflorescences and um, just taking chunks out of the leaves. We didn't have very many um, in the greenhouse at this time, so all we had to do was pick them off the plants and uh, and take care of them. That way, we didn't have to use any any chemicals to control them because there weren't that many. So that's one thing to look out for. And and then. Uh, Brian Whipker brought this plant to me uh, that he found while he was on a visit to a grower that had potivirus. So there's potivirus on Eucomus humilis was uh, was the species. So you can you can see in the photograph that there's um, some streaking and just some general modeling going on. So it's something you want to look out for and and have tested if if you think you have um, some virus symptomology. Some other pests and diseases that were found that have been reported on Eucomus, um, more and more have been reported over the years as more and more people start to grow it. You know, you see more uh, more things come up. So Ornithogalum mosaic virus has also been reported on Eucomus, and the symptomology for that you'll actually see clearer ring spots. Um, Xanthomonas, which can infect the bulbs, you just see the bulbs turning brown and starting to rot and uh, it'll make the leaf margins necrotic. Some botrytis has been reported and then also you know you want to watch out for the typical things um, slugs, snails, um, aphids and thrips and then the picture of this uh, this little guy over here on the right not necessarily a pest or disease um, but we did find him on our eucomus plants in the greenhouse one year and uh, that's part of our, our pest management at, uh, at NCSA. He keeps, he keeps the bugs down. <laughs> All right, so moving into plant growth regulators. Um, 
and we are trucking along here, so I appreciate you guys hanging in. This is a, a lot of information that we're going through here, so hopefully it'll it'll be good stuff for you. All right, so plant growth regulators um, are not necessary for eucomus, especially the ones that are bred to be more compact, like the Aloha series from Golden State Bulb Growers that's shown um, on the right. Um, you know, highlight levels promote naturally compact and sturdy plants, um, but you may be producing eucomus when you don't naturally have high light levels. So the PGRs could be necessary if you're producing it in the winter months, say you're trying to get these ready for, for Valentine's Day or for Mother's Day, um, or if they're under shade in, in high temperatures. And they've also, PGRs can also be useful to prevent post-harvest stretch in low light retail environments. So they do have uh, post-harvest benefits as well. So what we used for these studies um, was the was Leia from the Aloha series from Golden State. Um, like I said before, they're they're bred for to be dwarf for pot production. Um, they have this awesome tropical scent. Just I don't know. It smells like uh, like like suntan lotion, but not at, not chemically though. Like it's it's nice. Um, they're multi-flowering, so you'll get several flowers uh, per bulb, but then also they were f they flower again in the season. They won't flower as um, profusely. There won't be the same number of inflorescences the second time that they flower, but it will put out a couple more flowers if the conditions are right for where they are. All right, so what we did is we drenched with uh, three different PGRs, and uh, we used a four ounce drench per six, six and a half inch pot. Um, we used the PGR calculator to, to, to figure out all of these um, application uh, numbers for these. We used fluoroprimidol, uh, uniconazole, and paclobutrazole. And the photo shows the stage at which we drenched the eucomus, um, which is important because you know, if you wait later or at, say, visible bud, or if you do a bulb dip, you know, you could have different results. So we drenched them when they are about five centimeters tall or, or two and a half inches tall. And also this information um, we have in a publication that is about to be um, published in Hort Technology in February. So if anyone uh, wants this information, I can send you that publication uh, once it gets uh, put out. So just make sure you jot down my email and, and shoot me an email and I'll get that to you when it's, when it's available. So in general, we found that as the concentration of the PGRs increased, the plant height was shorter. So the PGRs do help to um, retard the growth of eucomus. Um, the plants were slightly more compact. It made the leaves kind of splay out a little bit more, but they were still um, more compact than the control. Uh, but it also um, increased the days to anthesis. So it increased the days to um, for it to flower, which is not necessarily a good thing, um, but there's give and take in, in anything. There were no phytotoxicities that were observed by any of the PGRs, which is also an excellent thing. Um, so in the photo, you, you can see the series of um, treatments that we did for fluoroprimidol. Um, the unit is milligrams per pot, and um, the check marks are concentrations that we would recommend of fluoroprimidol to control the growth of eucomus. Um, you can see in the control, it's it's really tall. It it looks almost kind of lanky. The flower that's leaning over to the left. I mean, if you put that in in a low light retail environment or even someone's home, you know that's going to flop over. It's not going to look very good. So a little bit of of PGR helped kind of wrangle that in, make a nice compact plant. Um, they still flowered very nicely, and a good 
good pot to plant ratio makes them makes them look very nice um, but the two and four milligrams per pot um, application rates concentrations were uh, too much they made the plants very short and the inflorescences some of them didn't even make it out of the center of the rosette of the leaves so it just it stunted them way too much so those concentrations are definitely not recommended so here are the photos for um, paclobutrazol and uniconazole. So um, similar results, uh, different concentration ranges that, that we would recommend. Um, you know, staying on the, the lower end of the recommendation, if you just want a little bit more control, say your light levels are you know, pretty high, like they're good, the, your retail environment is going to still have you know, a good light level, you may just want to um, do one do an application of a PGR just to make them a little more compact, um, and then you may want to go on the higher end of that recommendation if if you're growing in those winter months where you really don't have a lot of light, and you know you're going to have to wrangle them in a little bit more. All right, so that's the end of the uh, the pot production. So I'm going to move into a little bit about cut flowers. Um, hopefully there's some, some, some cut flowers, cut flower growers out there um, who, who are growing eucomus or want to grow eucomus and then also you know, include some pot production too. So sparkling burgundy um, is one of the most notable eucomus varieties that was used in the landscape and then as a very popular cut flower as well. Just gorgeous stems, great length. Um, you can also use the foliage and cut the foliage. It'll start to root in the vase. That's what we've had in our, our post-harvest studies for this. So like I said, eucomus likes to live. It's, it's very easy to propagate. Um, and then the photo on the, on the right is of some some cut stems of a, a lavender cultivar that were gorgeous that we had at NC State. So eucomus as a cut flower, a lot of um, some of the feedback that I've been hearing from some of the growers that grow it now are that they're, the florists that they sell to only see eucomus as tropical. So the photo on the left, you know, has eucomus used in, in that tropical look, um, which is which is nice but don't let eucomus be pigeonholed into just that look. Um, it can be incorporated into the design like on the right that has hydrangeas and willow, um, physocarpus, and amaranth. I mean that's something that I put together for a, um, a workshop that we were doing and eucomus fits right into that. It doesn't, it doesn't look odd. It doesn't make it look oddly tropical. So cut flower production, it can be um, field or greenhouse grown. Uh, so these photo, this photo here is obviously of field production and there's three different cultivars here that we've been traveling, trialing for um, Eddie Welsh who's a breeder in New Zealand who's been coming up with excellent cultivars for um, cut flower and pot production. Um, Tagula Jewel, uh, Megaroo and Tagula Gem are in there. Um, Jewel has that excellent red color to it. Megaru is uh, a very nice chartreuse um, white color and then Gem has this like bronzy orange color that's very nice. Um, you can grow them in the greenhouse in the, uh, the black plastic uh, lily crates and they, they do very well in either location depending on you know what kind of space you have. If you plant them in May you'll get about a July bloom it depends on the temperatures, the outdoor temperatures. The higher the temperatures, the faster they're going to bloom. Um, as the plants become more established and perennialized, um, they will bloom faster as well because they're, you know, they have good root systems, and then the bulbs are also getting bigger. So it helps it helps move along that inflorescence production. Um, if you're growing them in lily crates, you can put, we've trialed up to 12 bulbs per crate. Um, in this experiment, we did 6 or 12 bulbs in a crate and found that the higher planting density did not adversely affect um, production 
or the quality of the stems. So hey, use that use that space wisely and, and do do the closer spacing. And then you want to make sure that you do not harvest these stems before at least 50% of the flowers are open. Um, harvest time is really important in in cut flower production, and we did experiments. And if you harvest when greater than 50% of the florets are open, um, you will get better post-harvest life and that the seed pods that are gorgeous will continue to develop post-harvest and add to the length of post-harvest life for this flower. Um, unopened buds will continue to open. If you harvest too soon, the stem, tems, the stem tends to flop over in the vase, which is not good. It loses turgidity. Um, the bracts at the top can turn, uh, can start to turn brown and die. So you want to make sure that you harvest at the correct time. And harvesting is really easy. Um, you just reach down into the plant. Uh, don't think about spiders that might be down there. Uh, people who know me know that I do. I'm not a fan of of spiders, but that's okay. Um, just reach down in there. Uh, grab the, as close to the base of the stem as you can, give it a little twist and a pull, and they usually detach right from the bulb uh, pretty cleanly, but you still want to cut the, the end of the stem there so you can maximize water uptake when you put it in the bucket. So post-harvest, um, for Eucomus is ridiculously simple. Um, I've done so many experiments on cut Eucomus, and it always comes down to plain tap water, just plain old tap water, um, is perfect for Eucomus. Um, it does not really like floral preservatives. Um, we've seen that the the awesome vase life that it has, which is about 30 to 60 days, depending on the cultivar, so yes, this will last for a month in the vase. Um, if you use floral preservatives with it, that vase life might go down by a, a week or two, but I don't know, if you're putting it in an arrangement with other flowers that really benefit from floral preservatives, um, Eucomus is still going to outlast probably anything else that you have in that arrangement. So it's it's okay to incorporate it if you really need to. And another great thing about Eucomus is that it can be cold stored for for about two weeks. So it's we've tested it dry stored, so out of water, like in floral boxes, and two weeks cold stored is fine. So Eucomus is actually a really great crop that can be shipped as well. Um, and then also cold stored in water is the best um, option if you're trying to keep them long term. So the photo on the right is what I was talking about with the seed pods coloring up and getting really pretty. So if you harvest too soon you won't get good seed pod development and those pods take on uh, just really rich colors um, as the inflorescence ages and that's why the the cultivars from Eddie Welsh are named you know like gem and jewel because these seed pods form and they look like jewels they look like gems it's very very pretty all right so um, just wrapping up a little bit here with just some extra information that I'm sure you want to know is you're probably, I hope you guys are like, oh my gosh, Allison, I need these plants. Where can I get them? Um, so there's lots of suppliers for Eucomus. They'll each have different types of varieties. So, you know, some will be pot, some will be cut. Um, so you'll want to you want to talk with them and see what their availabilities are. Um, but ADR bulbs, Bill Moore and Company, Degoti, um, Edney, Glueckner, and uh, Golden State. Um, all have Eucomus, and then Plant Delights always has the, the really cool cultivars and species um, that, you know, for the, the, the dedicated Eucomus lovers. And then I, I have to thank all the people that helped help me get this research done um, with their funding and donations and just general caring and support. Um, ICFG and the Hill Foundation and the <clears throat> Glowekner Foundation for uh, for grant funding to do these experiments, and Degoti and Golden State for donating bulbs so we can so we can grow something. 
Um, and then, of course, thank you to NC State and the Horticulture Department and EGRO for um, giving me this opportunity to share my passion for Eucomus with you guys. And hopefully I can do another one of these again because this was awesome. I hope you guys had a good time too. And thank you to uh, Dr. John Dole and Dr. Brian Whipker. And then our awesome floriculture technicians, Ingram McCall and Diane Mays, who are like my right and left hands uh, most all the time. And then, of course, Eddie Welsh and, uh, and Brian Corriere from uh, Golden State Bulbs. All right. And then here's just a list. Sorry, I go just ahead. Have one more thing. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I just I put in this slide for different cultivars that we've um, that I've come across and some that we have trialed. So there's a few to start on for pot production and a few for cuts, um, just so you have something uh, to go by. And <clears throat> thank you for your attendance. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Thanks. All right, thank you, Allison. That's a lot of information. Um, we do have some some questions coming in, so uh, I'll I'll read through them. Uh, the, the first one, while you you catch your breath here a little bit. Um, so the the first question was about the uh, the calcium oxalate oxalate crystals. Um, do they let's see are are they forming uniform or variable in size? And then and does it mean that um, if they grow by are are they growing because the plant is accumulating calcium over time? Um, they're, they're pretty consistent in size and they're in every part of the bulb. It's not a, this is just something, an adaptation that Eucomus has to, um, to animals feeding on it. So it's, it's not a result of um, like over accumulation. All right. I, I hope that I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think I think it does. Okay. Um, so, in your PGR trials, did any of the PGRs um, increase the number of bulblets, um, or and or reduce the flower size as compared to the control? Um. Okay. The uh, reducing the number of bulblets. No, there was no difference. Well, there was no difference in the number of flowers that we got per plant in each of the treatments. So it did not affect the number of flowers that we got. Um, what was the second part? And then what about the flower size? Did you measure the flower size? The flower size, it did affect the height of the inflorescences. So yes, it reduced um, the size of the plant, not only in the foliage, but also with the inflorescences. Okay. Um, switching for a second over to uh, cut flower production, um, how often do you change the water in the vase for your studies? Okay, for our experiments, we actually do not change over the water. So we assume that most people don't do what we recommend they do in, in changing the water every you know two to three days or when it starts to get kind of nasty. Um, so, yeah, we, we refill vases, but we don't actually change out the water. Okay. Um, when, when the bulbs are emerging in pot production, um, does it help to have bottom heat um, for, for emerging the, the stalks, or is it just a work fine just to have them on the bench? Um, I, I don't see why having bottom heat would be a bad thing. Um, I haven't heard of anyone using that with Eucomus and we haven't tried it, but I think with how responsive it is to heat, um, that it wouldn't be a bad thing. It would definitely be worth trying to help, uh, to help get that emergence more even and to kind of speed things along. Okay. And in um, in relation to having these in the landscape, are they um, attractive for pollinators like butterflies and birds? Yes, pollinators love them. Uh, we always have to make sure for when we're harvesting our cut flowers, we have to make sure we get out there early, not just because it's it gets you know hotter the later it gets in the day, um, but because then the bees start to come out and the the bees love to 
to visit our Eucomus. So yes, de definitely pollinator friendly. Okay. And then uh, when you're buying the, the bulbs, do they typically come pre-chilled or um, do you have to go through the chilling process on your own? When you buy them, um, you'll, you'll want to make sure you ask the people that you're buying them from, but they do, they should come pre-chilled because they'll have certain times that they'll, that they'll want to send them out to you. And I know with, um, with Golden State, with the, the Leia series, they've, they've got that process down, um, so nicely of the, the chilling and when you want them to be ready that if you called them and said, well, you know, I want to produce it at this time to be flowering for, you know, Mother's Day, they would be able to um, provide you with bulbs that were chilled for that purpose. All right. Um, again, back to having them in the landscape, what is the cold hardiness of, of these bulbs? Okay, they, um, the previous literature has said about zone six, but um, we've had them here in Raleigh, and they're also doing trials up at Cornell with Eucomus and, you know, in New York, and they've had them over winter uh, consistently there. Uh, so, you know, zone five for sure, you know, if you're, if you're hesitant, um, put a layer of mulch over them, just like a couple inches. Um, and even in, in high tunnels, they do well. So uh, zone five, I would be confident in saying that they would um, be hardy to there, especially the newer hybrids. And then for, at uh, um, colder zones, um, would they respond well to being um, dug and stored inside like, uh, like people do with cannas or dahlias? Yes, they would. Um, I would suggest, well, if you're, for cut flower production, it would be easy to plant them in the, the black lily crates and have grow them in the crates, much like you do with like Asiatic lilies and Oriental lilies for cut production. Grow them in the, in the crates and then you can just take that whole crate and move it into a protected location. But that's still chilly, um, so they get that vernalization that they need um, for next year and you can transport them that way but you can also dig them it it puts them a little bit behind for the next year because you know you're digging them you're disturbing their roots um, and then you have to replant them and they have to you know, regrow all those roots um, but they they do respond well to that that's something that we've done okay um, I think that is all the questions that I've seen um, posted I'll give folks uh, just a moment or two to type in another question if I've um, accidentally missed it or you um, have a last minute question here. Um, but uh, other than that, I um, you know, want to thank everybody for, for joining us today. One thing that I did not mention at the, the beginning of this um, webinar is that we are recording this. So if you miss something or um, you know somebody that wasn't able to, to make this webinar live, we will have this posted on our website, e-growgro.org. Um, so look for that. Probably in the next 10 to, to 14 days, we'll get this posted and available. Um, okay, so here's uh, one more question. Um, for, um, for cut flowers, um, let's see. Are the flowering um, affected by uh, – do cutting the flowers affect the following year's growth, I think is the question. Okay. Um, n no. The – we haven't seen production decline significantly from year to year when we harvest all the flowers from the plants. So – no, it's good to, it's perfectly okay to continue to harvest the flowers. All right. Well, Allison, thank you very much. We appreciate you uh, giving this, this presentation on our webinar today. Um, I think we got a lot of great information, um, and uh, we, we hope to see you again here on eGrow. Excellent. Thank you so much. And if you guys have any other questions that you think of later, do not hesitate to email me. I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, 
So ascarlso at ncsu.edu, just call her at me. All right, thank you very much, Allison. Okay, thank you.